Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Much higher. Because yeah. bicycle tires, you pump over 100 psi, and cars are only, what, 30 or something? Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, particularly because much of this work was done uh, right here at Microsoft Research in collaboration with Mike Friedman, Carol Stengel, who was a postdoc here, Kevin Walker, who's also a frequent visitor, and many of you may know, and also uh, Zheng An Wang, who's also, I think, a frequent visitor here, many of you may know. So, uh, in order to introduce what I'll be talking about today, um, I'd like to just make briefly the point that in condensed matter physics, okay, what one often um, describes as a central problem is to understand 
different states of matter okay, that can arise in nature. And um, what I'll be talking about a little bit, the thrust of this work is trying to understand a particular class of states of matter and how they may be relevant possibly to problems like quantum computing. Now, uh, kind of the simplest and most, in many ways, most familiar is basically an elastic medium, okay? Uh, and this is a simple caricature which describes many states of matter. So if you have an elastic medium, it's ground state, it's roughly flat. You can imagine ripples on it, okay? And because the ground state is breaking a symmetry, which is a symmetry under uh, the translation of the sheet, the low energy excitations as they get to long wavelengths are gapless in energy. Okay? And this is a very useful caricature. It also basically describes magnets or a large class of magnets in which the spins in the magnet or the small mag microscopic magnetic moments point in some particular direction. Okay? And because a uniform rotation of all the spins is a symmetry of the system, a slowly varying rotation very slowly from point to point costs very little energy. Okay? And this is uh, often called a broken symmetry state. Okay? Uh, crystal is the same thing in which you can uniformly translate the crystal. And so therefore, uh, a slowly varying translation of the different atoms in a crystal is a low energy excitation. And low energy excitations are important because they're also what you can observe at long wavelengths. So they're the things that are going to determine most macroscopic experiments probing uh, the properties of uh, basically ma any, any matter that one might encounter um, in daily life or otherwise. Now, what I'll be talking about is something that's, uh, in some sense, the antithesis or at least a different possibility from a broken symmetry state or continuum elastic medium. And uh, these particular states of matter, which are topological states, they also have a useful caricature, which is basically some kind of sea of fluctuating loops, okay? Which I'm drawing here is kind of a art, well, not really an artist, my rendition, my unartistic rendition of what a sea of fluctuating loops might look like. And, uh, the idea, again, is that this is a general paradigm for a particular class of states of matter. The ways in which these loops may arise microscopically from the underlying degrees of freedom uh, are various. For instance, if you have uh, a model of Ising-like spins okay, on a triangle lattice, as I've drawn on the left here, then you can see that the domain walls between up and down spins are loops living on a uh, honeycomb or hexagonal lattice. Okay. I guess you can't see it so well, but you see that there are some loops here separating the up from the down spins. Uh, another way in which loops might arise microscopically is uh, if you have a system of spins on a lattice, then uh, one way of understanding spin zero states is to think of them in terms of different states which are formed by forming spin singlets between different pairs of spin a halves. Okay? So you have spins living on, in this case, a square lattice on each of the sides of the square lattice, and they can form these bonds, like that I've drawn here with these lines, in which the two spin halves have formed a spin singlet. Okay. Now, uh, yeah. One. one. Well, I'm actually going to be talking principally about um, two dimensions. Okay, so uh, I think that there are three dimensional analogs. Everything I'm going to say, or some of the one of particular state of matter that I'm going to be talking about does have a very simple three dimensional analog in which you're still talking about loops. Okay. But most of what I'll be talking about is in two dimensions. That's a very good question. Okay, so. You can think of a system of spins on a lattice. Uh, it may be the case, and for many Hamiltonians, it is the case that low energy states are composed of states in which neighboring spins form singlets. And by then taking any such configuration of singlets and superposing it with some reference configurations, what the dotted lines are, you see that you end up with configurations of loops, okay? some of which may be 
kind of microscopic loops of just length two over here. So the point of this is that there are various ways in which systems of electrons or spins or what have you can uh, have, can so arrange or self-organize in such a way that their low energy physics is just best characterized or parameterized in terms of loops, which of course can fluctuate. Yet another example here is uh, a particularly useful one for what I'll be talking about, which is you may have a system of spins such that the up spins form chains, which uh, can be connected up into loops, uh, and the other sides, which I haven't drawn in, are where the down spins are. Uh, a particular model due to Alexei Kataev, who is also the postdoc and vis frequent visitor here, uh, is on the left, uh, sorry, on the right side of uh, this slide, and the basic Hamiltonian here is defined as follows. Suppose on the lattice that I've drawn on the left, I've only drawn in some up spins over here, but let's say that there's actually a spin on every single link of this lattice, okay, which can point up or down. I just haven't bothered in that picture to draw in the down spins to avoid clutter. Now, um, the Hamiltonian that governs these spins is a sum of uh, a number of terms half of which are terms that are on every vertex of this lattice and half of which are terms on every plaquette. The terms on vertices are just the product of sigma z's <coughs> on all the links surrounding that vertex. So it's just a product of plus or minus ones. The plaquette term is a product of the sigma x's on all of the links around a given plaquette. So the first term is just takes, there are four spins here around a given vertex, you multiply together. So there are those spins in a sigma z basis are either plus or minus one, corresponding to up or down. You multiply those together, okay? And you add up such a term for every vertex of the lattice. There's also a plaquette term, and a given plaquette has four spins encircling that plaquette, and you multiply together the sigma x's, okay? And what you can observe just from looking at the first term is that it's a product of sigma z's, and the Hamiltonian is such a term um, enters the Hamiltonian with a minus sign. And so to minimize energy, you actually want such a term to have eigenvalue 1 rather than eigenvalue minus 1. And eigenvalue 1 occurs when there's an even number of upspins and an even number of downspins uh, around any vertex. And so that's telling you that if where the up spins are is where you're drawing in loops, and any loop that enters a vertex must also leave a vertex. So there, in order to minimize the first terms in the Hamiltonian, their energy, you should be looking at um, configurations in which the up spins are connected into uh, connected closed loops. Now, so. The basic point of what I've been saying is that, in fact, many of these kinds of systems that one encounters in electronic physics uh, can be thought of in terms of loops. Uh, now, the loops, of course, there's also quantum mechanics here. and It's only by introducing quantum mechanics that any magic can happen. And these loops are going to obey certain quantum dynamics, right? So all I've really been discussing thus far is kinematics, in a sense, what the basic uh, low energy states look like. They're going to have to obey some quantum dynamics, and that dynamics, we'll see, can impose some topological rules. And depending on what those particular rules are, the system may end up in some stable gap topological phase, a topological state of matter, which I haven't defined for you yet exactly what that means, but I will. Uh, or it may instead be in a critical point, or if one is, from this point of view, unlucky, you may end up in a broken symmetry state instead. And in this picture, excitations are violations of these rules, okay? So when I say quantum dynamics, I also mean, by implication, a Hamiltonian. And so excitations are uh, localized points at which the Hamiltonian is taking some value other than its minimal value. One way of doing this clearly is to break loops. And so you have excitations. There are other types of excitations as well, but there are excitations which correspond to endpoints of these broken loops. And the rules obeyed by these loops determine various properties of these kinds of excitations, including rating statistics, ground state degeneracies, and so on. Okay. Now, some of this seems a little abstract, but I'll give you a very simple example 
which hopefully will make this a little bit clearer. This is this model that I just introduced two slides ago. And as we noted, uh, the first term, the AIs, uh, let me go back and remind you what the Hamiltonian is. The Hamiltonian is, again, the sum of terms corresponding to vertices and plaquettes. Now, the one key observation here is that, in fact, this Hamiltonian is exactly soluble because every single term in this Hamiltonian commutes with every other term. So in that sense, it's, it's trivial. If you take a look at, so the vertex term is multiplying these spins over here. So this is a vertex. And you've also got a plaquette term acting on this plaquette here. And what you see is that a given plaquette and a given vertex can either share zero or two spins. Okay? If they share zero spins, then clearly the operators commute. If they share two spins, then since sigma x and sigma z anti-commute, you get two minus signs. And so again, the operator a, v, and f, p will commute. So these operators all commute with each other. Okay? And consequently, this model is exactly soluble. And the way to solve it is to, is to diagonalize every one of these operators. They sh the AVs should all take eigenvalue plus one. The FPs should also all take eigenvalue plus one. Now, the meaning of the first statement that the AVs all take eigenvalue plus one is clear. It's what I said a few minutes ago. It's just that you can think of the ground state. You can think of uh, the, the states which have lower. So maybe a useful exercise is to let J1 be extremely large. So J1 is much, much larger than J2. And then you can essentially forget about anything that doesn't have AV equal plus one, right? Now, those are all states which have upspins which can be connected to form sequences of closed loops, okay? On the square lattice, those loops can actually intersect. That doesn't matter very much, or it's not particularly inconvenient for the state that I'm about to talk about. For other states, it may be inconvenient, and one should use a different lattice, like the honeycomb lattice, where this, this problem wouldn't arise. Okay. So now, if we just focus on these uh, configurations of loops on the square lattice, then we also have to diagonalize these operators FP. And FP, having eigenvalue 1, imposes the following relations on the ground state. The way FP acts is, remember, sigma x flips an upspin to a downspin and a downspin to an upspin. Okay. So if sigma if FP acts on, here's a plaquette here, if it acts on this plaquette, it'll flip these three upspins into downspins, and it'll flip this downspin into an upspin, and you end up with this. Okay. Similarly, if it, FP acts on configuration like this, where you have four upspins around a plaquette, it'll flip it into a situation like this, in which you have no spin, ups, all the spins on the given plaquette are down. And if you have a situation like this, with two upspins here, it'll flip these two into downspins and flip these two into upspins. And you have a situation like this. Okay. So uh, the statement that the ground state is an eigenvalue under this operation tells you that the ground state has to give equal amplitude for a situation like this as for a situation like this, and so on. Okay. Uh, or, quite simply, you can, sim you can simply say the ground state can be viewed as an equal amplitude superposition of all possible loop configurations. Okay. Now, can, yes? I, I think I'm misunderstanding. Okay. So, okay, in, in, you, in the definition of FP, I, uh. I, I see FP as giving a value to configuration. So, mm -hmm. and if you have some spins around the plaquette, that would give a value, which would be, I would write that value in the plaquette, right? Uh, uh, well, OK, so FP is a product of sigma x's. So if you work in a basis in which sigma z is diagonal, which is the implication when I draw these loop configurations. So a, a configuration like this has ups, up, all these spins are up. Now, FP is a product of sigma x's. So sigma x doesn't have a well-defined value here. Right? So this is not an eigenvalue of any of these sigma x's nor of their product. And so actually, when you act with sigma x, 
sigma x takes this configuration or this state and transforms it into this one. How does sigma x act? Sigma x acts, um, so if sigma z in matrix notation is 1 minus 1, then sigma x is 0, 1, 1, 0. This is in a basis where an upspin is 1, 0, and a downspin is 0, 1. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you should think of sigma x as a spin flip operator. It flips up, down to up, and up to down, where sigma z is just telling you 1 or minus 1. Now, uh, the statement that I finished with here was that the ground state can be viewed as an equal amplitude superposition of all possible loop configurations, but that actually statement requires little care because uh, it may or may not be correct to use the singular here depending on the topology of the underlying manifold. Because if you look, for instance, at the annulus, you put the system on annulus, then, in fact, there are two distinguishable ground states uh, corresponding to even or odd winding numbers around the origin and the annulus. Because this equality here tells you that, in fact, winding numbers are only conserved modulo 2, and that the ground state will mix, let's say, winding number 0, winding number 2, winding number 4, and so on, and similarly with odd winding numbers. But there's no <clears throat> term in the Hamiltonian that causes mixing of different one, of uh, winding numbers of different parity. So, in fact, there are two inequivalent ground states on the annulus. However, they also clearly cannot be distinguished by any local measurements since the, F, the Fs and As are a complete set of local operators. Okay. So there's nothing local that distinguishes these. It's only some topological property, namely the even and oddness of the winding number that distinguishes these two states. Now, that's part of the reason why one would call this a topological state of matter. It's that you have two distinguishable, you have a gap, first of all, with excitations. So at low energies, let's say you can forget about all the excitations. If you're only doing experiments that uh, are probing physics, that is to say you only do experiments involving frequencies less than this gap energy, and you only do experiments at wavelengths that are uh, long compared to the relevant length scale, which in this case is actually one lattice spacing, then forget about all excitations. You only have ground states. And the ground state structure, of, in the, which in this case is twofold depending on the, um, on the annulus, the ground state structure depends on the topology underlying space and nothing else. So in particular, for this particular Hamiltonian, you have ground state 2 on the annulus. You have ground state 4 on the torus. You have ground state 4 to the g on a genus G surface. Okay? So there's a ground state degeneracy that depends on the topology of the manifold, number one. And number two, these different ground states are not distinguishable by any local measurements. Okay? Now, the second sense, in which, there's, which is related, in which there's topology that arises here, is that when one starts to look at the excitations, these excitations are vertices or plaquettes at which A i is equal to minus one, or F p, is equal to minus 1. And these correspond to either taking a loop and breaking it, okay, so you now have two endpoints, or frustrating one of these plaquettes so that Fp is minus 1 around such a plaquette. And uh, I won't go through this in detail now, but can certainly come back if later if someone's interested. Uh, and you can do the exercise to show that, in fact, there is non-trivial braiding associated with taking one of these types of excitations around another. Okay. So the reason that this is useful, so I still haven't given you a definition. I mean, in the sense that there's a, a good definition of a topological state, a topological phase of matter, it would be that the low energy effective field theory is a topological field theory, meaning the low energy effective field theory can be written down without introducing a metric. Okay. As a practice, that's a little bit, perhaps a little bit too abstract. Uh, and as a practical matter, what it really means is that you have a ground state degeneracy, which depends on the topology of the manifold, okay, and that these different degenerate ground states are indistinguishable by local experiments, and that you have excitations which have non-trivial braiding statistics. Okay. 
Now, a local perturbation, the reason that this is useful uh, potentially for quantum computation is that precisely the statement that these different and equivalent ground states cannot be distinguished by local measurements. Because if um, you think of the environment as disrupting your system by performing a local measurement, it can't distinguish these two different states. So in essence, the two or whatever qubits or however you wish to think of the quantum information, those states cannot be, what you don't want to have happen is you don't want in the middle of a computation for uh, the environment to measure whether you're in state zero or one, let's say. And here it can't. So what it could do, for instance, is a local perturbation system could flip a spin, okay? But what's most likely to happen, of course, is that the spin will flip back and it will radiate off some energy and, you know, in the form of radiation and the system will heal itself. Now, this is usually a bad thing because in this process you'll get a different, you'll acquire a different phase depending on which state you were in, okay? And so you'll get some dephasing as well. And this is what decoherence is. Now, in this situation, precisely because all local physics is the same in these two inequivalent ground states, the phases that will be acquired in this way will be the same as well. It's only some measurement which can really distinguish these two states that could cause them to decohere. And it's a another um, way of thinking about different states of matter is the associated rigidities that, that come with them. So the continuum elastic medium that I mentioned earlier has a rigidity associated with it. It has a shear modulus. It has a bending modulus. Okay, solids are solid, right? And the reason that they're solid is because they involve breaking of translational symmetry. Well, topological states also have... Right. Well, you can build an annulus, though. But and you could put, you could build something with multiple punctures instead of an annulus. Yeah. And actually, well, let me come back to your question. I, let me answer that in more detail a little bit later in the talk, also. Okay. Uh, so here, I mean, the kind of rigidity that we have is this rigidity against uh, local perturbations, and that's where this idea, uh, due to Alexi and Mike and, and pioneers in this field, of uh, topologically protected qubits comes from. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do is just briefly mention how much of the structure of that simple model can be generalized. Okay. So if you consider wave functions as, you know, usually you think of in quantum and simple quantum mechanics as wave functions psi of x, right? You have an x somewhere, which is the position of a particle, and you want to know what the probability amplitude is that you are at x, you just take psi of x norm squared, and that's the probability that your particle is at position x. Well, here, let's say you have a system of spins like we were talking about. Well, you want to know what, let's say, the probability or probability amplitude is for there to be up spins at certain locations and down spins at certain other locations, right? And that may be the kind of thing you want to know. And so there should be a wave function which tells you that. And uh, if you assume that you're in this low energy space where J1 that I wrote down before is taken very large, then you can forget about any uh, configurations in which the up spins don't form up chains, then you can really just restrict your attention to some multi-loops alpha like I've drawn here, and remembering that these represent the positions of the up spins if we're talking about that model uh, that I was just talking about in the last few slides, or that these represent the positions, uh, locations of these spin singlet dimers or whatever the underlying microscopic physics is in the model at hand, then this is going to give you the probability amplitude for that particular configuration. And uh, one property that these wave functions should satisfy in any reasonable class of theories that you would expect to give rise to a topological phase is that it should be invariant under smooth deformations of these loops. Okay. So the wave function takes the same amplitude, has the same amplitude there. 
Okay. Uh, a second property uh, that one would like is that if you have a small contractible loop somewhere, you should be able to erase it. That is to say, the wave function should have almost the same amplitude for a configuration with or without a small contractible loop. I say almost because it could get multiplied by a factor d, which happened to be 1 in the model that we just, just solved, uh, but in general could be an arbitrary number, or you might imagine that it could be an arbitrary number. You would at the very least expect such a relation, otherwise it's clear that you would have infinitely many ground states even in the absence of any topology. So you need a, a Hamiltonian with quantum dynamics that at least imposes some restriction of this form. Okay. Now the final thing is, uh, which we had in this model, is we had some kind of invariance of the wave function under a, quote, surgery relation, which cut and rejoined some loops, so that when two loops came close together, you could cut them and rejoin them like this. Okay? And again, with, without a relation like this, the ground state degeneracy on the torus or the annulus would have been infinite. It's only because of having a relation like this that we ended up with uh, twofold degeneracy of the annulus and four to the G on a genus G manifold. And this one, too, presumably has some kind of generalization. Okay? And by generalizing these latter two conditions that will uh, construct a, a family of topological states of matter, all of which have this kind of description in terms of quantum loop gases or fluctuating loops. Okay. Now, there are clearly going to be some consistency conditions in, well, let me first say one other thing, which is, uh, why, why do we even care? Right? Why, do we even, why are we even worried about uh, trying to generalize this? We have a model seems to have this nice feature of being topologically protected. Uh, why not just declare victory and withdraw right now? Um, and I'll refrain from making the obvious jokes about current political situation, but um, there are some good reasons not to just declare victory and withdraw right now, which is uh, we do have topological protection. Now, the problem with this is that So let's say, roughly speaking, these are, on the annulus, uh, our two ground states, where I've drawn here something with winding number zero, but by implication, this actually means a linear superposition. This is shorthand for a linear superposition of all possible pictures which have even winding number. Okay? And over here, you have uh, shorthand for a linear, a linear superposition of all possible pictures that have odd winding number. Okay? Now, it is great. There is this wonderful fact that uh, the, the environment is not going to cause decoherence between these. You can set up a linear superposition, or it's not going to cause one to flip into the other, at least not uh, in the thermodynamic limit. It will be very, very, it'll be exponentially difficult for the environment to cause one Y number to flip into the other. But the flip side, the problem of this is that it's also equally difficult for us to do anything useful with these. Okay. I mean, you want to do operations, you want to switch one into the other, and that's clearly very difficult here. So it's not only topologically protected from the environment, it's also topologically protected from us. And finally, how would you even do a measurement to determine what the final answer is here? That also looks very difficult. So there are a couple of uh, issues worth pondering here, namely that while we have all this great topological protection, we also maybe have a little too much at least insofar as trying to do anything useful with this. So uh, this, is part, this is related to the fact that what we have here is actually an abelian state, okay, in which all that can happen as a result of grading operations is you can pick up a phase or something. Well, you can pick up, at most you can pick up a phase when you take two, one excitation around another. Uh, and so actually it behooves us to take a look at non-abelian states in which you have uh, more interesting kinds of transform that is non-abelian representations of the Bray group with which non uh, states of matter which are associated with non-abelian representations of the Bray group so that when you take one excitation on another, you can actually uh, enact some kind of non-trivial operation on the Hilbert space. Okay? So that's the motivation for looking at generalizations of this. So this sort of does, this does half the job, but by doing half the job, it actually does too much. 
And so that's why we, we are looking at generalizations. Uh, but the generalizations that I'll be talking about have many features in common with this very simple model. Now, if you turn to look at this problem of generalizing this, you immediately see that it's, it's, it's not obvious, or at least you immediately see that it's a highly constrained problem. Because let's say that D is not equal to 1. Okay? Then if you assume that you had the old surgery relation that we had in the D equals 1 case, which is the surgery relation here, uh, then you can see that you take this curve, you continuously deform it into this, you then apply the surgery relation to get this, and then you... Uh, use the relation for D, then you ha immediately have a contradiction. Okay? So you can't do it in the most naive way possible of just changing D. So what you have to do is if you change D, you also have to change the surgery relation. And it's clear there's really virtually no other choice for the surgery relation. You could have had uh, with two lines, your really only choices were to have a plus or minus sign here since applying the surgery relation twice had to get you back to the same picture. So... Uh, what you have to do is you ne then are required to look at surgery relations that involve three, four, however many curves, depending on D. And in fact, there's an important mathematical result here, which is that for almost all D, there is really no consistent surgery relation. Uh, and it's only for very special Ds that sur consistent surgery relations can be found. These are these values, d equals 2 times cosine of pi over k plus 2. And they increase in complexity as you increase d or increase k. So, for instance, the next one is d equals square root of 2. And you can see that the relation has five terms and involves taking three curves and cutting them and rejoining them in different possible ways that don't involve lines crossing. Okay? And you can also see that these relations now have some non-trivial coefficients inside of them. Okay. And the next one, is, the next value of D is K equals 3, which is the golden mean. And Yeah, maybe we can solve it here. I don't know what happened there. Well, oh. Wait. Yeah, I think this thing just came loose, the connection. Wait, hang on, no, 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 I think I'll get it right, yeah. No, no, hang on, I think this will work. Yeah, I think this core just came loose. So, um, so you end up with relations like this. Now, this may not sing to you just yet, but if you think about it for a minute, it's a relation like this which leads to having uh, non-trivial properties. So, for instance, supposing now that I have uh, four excitations, all of which are the kind of excitations you make by breaking... Uh, loops and you have endpoints now. Now what you can see is that I can, let's say, exchange excitations 2 and 3 in a counterclockwise manner, and I can also exchange excitations 3 and 4. And what you'll observe is, depending on the order in which I do that, I can either go here and then end up over here, or if I do it in the opposite order, I end up with a different state. So 
this is why this is called a not, this is why this is a non-abelian representation of the braid group. It's that the order in which you do these operations, these braiding operations matters, number one. Number two, you'll observe that if D were equal to one, that is to say if we had that surgery relation that we have in the simplest Kataev model, then you could apply the surgery relation right here, and you'd see that this state is in fact the same as this state, or possibly up to a sign or something like that. Okay. So uh, similarly, you do these exchanging operations and nothing happens, really, or nothing much interesting happens. But here, this state is a distinct one from this. Even though they're locally indistinguishable, if you look anywhere locally here, there's no difference because these lines are really fluctuating, and there's no difference in these two states. But in fact, they're linearly independent. Okay? And so if you have four quasi-particles at fixed positions, then you actually have multiple linearly independent states. Okay? And it's in that, that space of multiple linearly independent states, and obviously as you increase the number of quasi-particles, the number of states increases, that's your playground to do computation. And the way you can move around within that space is by doing these kinds of exchanging operations. Okay? So you still have the same, so now you can see where there's some extra juice here, which is that you still have this topological protection because there's no difference locally between this state and this state. But if you take these, if you have, can figure out a way to take a state, one of these excitations and drag it around, then you can now actually do something with the Hilbert space. So at least half, one part of the problem uh, of not being able to do anything is solved because you can take these excitations and bring them around each other. Okay. Uh, well, so the measurement problem, uh, it's maybe a little less clear, but again, there, there's at least one thing that you can imagine, which is if you take these two excitations and you just fuse them, okay, and take these and fuse them, in this state, you're basically taking this and just fusing it back into the vacuum. There's sort of nothing going on there. Whereas over here, you take these and fuse them, and you are left with an excitation that has two lines coming out of it. So you have something left over in this case, which you don't in this case. And if you have some way of measuring that, whether or not you have something left over, then you might be able to, to do that measurement. Okay. Yeah. So um, it it may or may not. So uh, one thing I didn't particularly emphasize here is that really, you know, the way these lines are drawn. In, I mean, this is quantum mechanics. So really, these lines have some are winding around these points with some angular momentum, essentially. And so these excitations, while they both have two lines coming out of them, actually have different angular momenta. So they may, have diff they may actually have different energies. So if you have some way of distinguishing energies, you might even be able to tell which you have. Uh, I guess that also depends. Well, let me be careful. Um, I mean, I think to some extent it may not really matter in the sense that it, I think it's just a software problem whether or not, no, ser seriously, what, it may only be important that you just, and I know it's funny saying this to the software company, it may only be important to be able to distinguish nothing from something. And what that something is introduces some extra overhead, but may not really be important. But again, I think that it might be possible to actually distinguish what that something is between uh, these different angular momentum states. If you have a, I mean, that all that's heavily dependent on, you know, what your how sophisticated your measurement technique is. Whether you'd rather pay the extra overhead in measurements or in software, maybe. Yeah. My guess is that uh, it will require heroic efforts to be able to distinguish something from nothing. And so you're probably better off doing as much else as you can do with software. You're probably better off. OK. So uh, to give you an example for, uh, so for k equals 2, um, we have the surgery relation over here. Now, um, 
what you can see is if you take, let's say, particles two and three and then wind them around each other like that, then in fact, because of that surgery relation of that form, you can apply it, let's say, on these three lines over here, and you see that it's actually a linear combination of uh, these other states. So you can, using these surgery relations, you can reduce, you know, you can figure out what the results that you can basically do these computations. Okay, and that's it's essentially these types of computations that are being done by the system. Okay. Uh, similarly, you can also convince yourself that there are nine ground states on the torus, roughly corresponding to winding numbers zero, one, and two, along these different directions. Now, uh, I start out by discussing these kind of caricatures for states of matter, and I said that in some sense, the definition of a topological state is that its low energy effective field theory should, uh, does not need to, can, can be written down without invoking a metric that say it's topologically invariant. Now, uh, or correlation functions are topologically invariant. Now, um, what I've been talking about now mostly is wave functions for some specific Hamiltonians, which even though we were writing them in some abstract fashion, they were really just some particular wave functions some particular characteristic or representative wave functions. Now, uh, it's very useful in thinking about kind of general properties of states of matter to look at the field theory, which is not tied down to any particular local microscopic model. Okay, so the associated field theories for all these states that I'm talking about are gauge theories. But these unusual braining properties that we're talking about when you take these particles around each other all of that arises from some generalization of the aronoff bohm effect, okay? So aronoff bohm effect, I'll remind you, is just this famous observation that, you know, if you put flux, magnetic flux, let's say through, the, through some region where a particle is not allowed to go, then even though the particle never goes anywhere where there's magnetic, out here, magnetic field is equal to zero, but there's still a net phase difference associated with two different trajectories around this region. Okay. But in, in other words, in quantum mechanics, the vector potential takes some real life, and it's not just the magnetic field alone, which is enough. Okay. And so you can see in particular as an electron goes around a region with flux inside, it picks up some phase. It's, it's, a, it's basically a generalization of that, which gives, in these gauge theory descriptions, which gives all the physics I've just been discussing. Now, all this physics of curves or all this kind of pictures that I've been drawing, these are all related to operators and gauge theories, which are called Wilson loop operators, or in other words, are just holonomies of the associated connections. Um, and uh, the fact that all the loops I was drawing here were unoriented loops are just a feature of SU2, where roughly speaking, it's the fact that the fundamental representation of SU2 is pseudo-real, leads to unoriented loops. And in fact, uh, there are generalizations of this involving directed loops, colored loops, you know, loops that carry several colors, and so on. So, the kind of um, standard or most famous topological field theory is Trent simons theory. Okay. The abelian version is for U1 gauge field, and just drop this term over here, and it's just for a U1 connection A, it's A wedge DA, okay, the Trent simons form. You integrate that over space-time, that's the action for the system. Uh, you can see it doesn't involve a metric. For non-abelian groups, you can also introduce, in fact, you need to, for the agent variance, introduce an extra term here. So uh, it, you can vary this action and derive some classical equations of motion. But classical equations of motion are just that the curvature of this connection should vanish. Okay. Now, uh, there's some important gauge invariant operators here. So gauge invariant meaning invariant under the local changes of coordinates, uh, local changes of SU2 coordinates uh, in this theory. And these are basically the traces of the holonomies of this connection. Okay. And the relation to everything that I've been talking about comes out of the fact that from this action, for these operators, you can derive some, al some commutator algebra which basically says when you take these operators, you commute them, what you end up with on the right-hand side, or try to commute them, you end up with the right-hand side with some linear combination of these operators, but on curves that involve 
basically splicing together uh, these, the two curves involved wherever they intersect. And the basic kind of representation theory problem of representing this algebra leads you right back to all the structure that we just talked about that we, were, that we essentially discussed from the point of view of generalizing the Kitayev model. You get back to the same structure. You now have some operators W, which you represent on wave functions psi of beta by, in the following way, in this following kind of pictorial way, by just taking the union of whatever the argument is here with this curve, unless there are intersections, and intersections are resolved in a certain way. Okay? And once you put that in, you, in fact, get back uh, operators W that satisfy the desired commutation relations. You, of course, also, as you can probably anticipate, get back all the structure uh, that we were just talking about a few slides ago. Uh, for instance, when you take um, uh, two curves which don't intersect, you can, of course, deform them continuously so they intersect twice. And using that resolution of crossings, you can see that these two, are, in fact, will give you the same thing if and only if D satisfies the required values. Okay? So it's a tightly constrained system which you can either arrive at from this point of view that you're trying to generalize. Um, K no, K, K is this number that enters here in the action and, and enters the commutation relations as well. Okay. So, um, roughly speaking, then, we have the following situation in which you can describe the physics in different ways at different length scales. <clears throat> at the shortest scales, it's just some physics of electrons and spins. At points, you have a local Hamiltonian, which is a sum of local operators. So everything is kind of zero-D physics of local interactions okay, between, let's say, spins here and their neighboring spins. Then we go to intermediate length scales. And in intermediate length scales, you sort of forget about this grainy microscopic structure, and everything is sort of 1D physics of loops. Okay? Uh, and then you go to the longest length scales, and then you can even forget about loops, really, and it's just maybe some degenerate ground states on genus D surfaces or brain group representations for quasi-particles, and it's all kind of the whole full 2D physics is recovered at the longest length scales. Now, this particular way of thinking about it actually begs the following question, which is that in a stable phase of matter, it's often the case that the intermediate length scale physics is actually the physics of some nearby critical point. Okay? And it's only at the longest length scales that the order sets in. And here, the intermediate length scale physics is all this 1D physics of curves and loops, and for that physics, in fact, these surgery relations are not particularly important, okay? But just invariance under continuous deformations and the ability to shrink contractible loops is really all you need. It's only at much longer distances that the system realizes, you know, at intermediate scales, the system doesn't know if it's on a torus or a sphere or whatever. It's at longer scales that all of that physics arises, and it's at longer scales also going to lower frequencies that you then realize that the system has an energy gap. Okay? When you're at intermediate scales and therefore intermediate energy scales as well, the system the gap doesn't matter. Your energy is above the gap. The fact that you're on a torus doesn't matter. You're looking at scales short compared to that. And so the physics in some sense looks more like just de-isotopy, which may be the physics of some nearby critical point. And from this point of view of imposing relation, you know, one doesn't ordinarily think about going into a phase by, go, by, by going to its nearby critical point and going into the phase. Because after all, critical points are hard to get to. You're almost never at critical points. But phases occupy some finite part of the phase diagram. So it's from the usual point of view, you know, if you're interested in a particular phase, the critical point is theoretically interesting, but probably not that useful. But here it's a little bit different because you know, we're understanding this phase as imposing certain relations, and the critical point arises by imposing not more, but fewer relations. And so from that point of view, in terms of tuning, in some sense, the critical point is easier uh, to envision. Uh, 
that I can think of. Yeah. It's an unusual way of thinking of a field theory, or an unusual way of thinking of a physical system, you know, in terms of imposing conditions so in this way. Um, no, it's more like the, I, okay, so it, it has more to do with an approach to a problem rather than the underlying problem, I think, which is that, uh, we, you know, we can't solve all Hamiltonians, right? And so, obviously, the stable phase occupies a larger part of the phase diagram, and so there's some uh, big region out here. Okay, and here's a critical point, maybe, and then there's, you know, some other phases out here. So, obviously, it is harder to get here than to get here, but in terms of soluble Hamiltonian, soluble models, that's really hard to get to here because it involves two neural parameters, whereas it, it may be easier to get to something soluble or at least get into this neighborhood and then hope to be, once you hope to be in this neighborhood, then at least if you know something about this critical point, for instance, if it has rel few relevant directions, mm -hmm. then your chances of getting into the phase you're interested in may be easier. So it ha I think it has more to do with that. Yeah. So, uh, in particular, so this doesn't look, of course, simpler. So I'm, what I've written down here is a Hamiltonian which imposes of the relations that I showed you earlier. So out of these three relations, it imposes this isotopy invariance, okay? And it imposes some basic fugacity, D, for small contractible loops. It doesn't impose any kind of surgery relation. Now, this looks considerably more complicated than the tire model that I wrote down earlier, only because what you're really doing here is you're taking that model, which is simple in terms of some vertex and some uh, plaquette terms, and the vertex terms are unchanged. They're still requiring closed loops. The plaquette terms had to be mutilated to get rid of the surgery relation. And so it looks ugly, but in fact, it's really simple. Okay. Believe me, it's, it is simple. Uh, so what this does, it implies this relation for D and isotopy without surgery. Now, as I said, as unlike in that case, these different terms in the Hamiltonian don't commute with each other. Okay. However, they do have, a, 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 they do annihilate, a, the, in fact, the same ground state wave function as for the Kataev model. Okay. Because it, that is to say, on the sphere or some surface with trivial topology, precisely because as long as you're not worried about winding numbers, then isotopy and D are all you need. And the ground state is just the sum over all configurations with, instead of equal amplitude, it's an amplitude D to the number of loops. And this can now be interpreted, uh, as in the case of the stable phases, also as a topological, oh, sorry, as a loop gas with some fugacity D squared, because if you take the norm squared, the wave function, it looks just like the partition function of the ON loop model, where N is D squared. And <clears throat> let me just remind you, this loop model is basically some way of, it's sort of an analytic continuation of the following. If you think of a model of ON spins, so spins pointing on S N minus 1, then uh, for E to the minus beta H, if you write down this funny looking thing over here and expand it in powers of X, then you get an expansion of loops, which are loops are correspond to all the places where you've chosen this term rather than this term in the expansion of this product, and you get x over n to the length of loop times n to the number of loops. And <clears throat> whereas this is only well-defined for n, an integer, this is perfectly well-defined for n non-integer as well, and so one could instead take this as the definition of the model. Okay, and call it instead of the ON model, a quote, ON loop model. And that model is exactly soluble. Uh, and so that statistical mechanics information tells us at least about some ground state information in this quantum mechanical problem. Okay. So, first of all, it's, uh, it's not by any means typical that two plus one dimensional uh, quantum mechanical problems will have a ground state which has a simple interpretation in terms of a two plus zero dimensional statistical mechanics model, but this is an example of that. 
And another well-known example is Laughlin's wave function in the quantum Hall effect. Its norm square is a classical plasma in two dimensions. So, okay, so using this, um, st the, the known statistical mechanics of these models, we can immediately derive some ground state properties. So, for instance, we know that loops meander over long distances determined by some exponents, which can be obtained as a function of n. Uh, this is all in the um, low temperature phase of this model. And in fact, if you go to the zero temperature limit, it's actually basically the same thing as the FK representation of not low temperature, but critical 2 equals n squared state plus model, which actually has the same exponents. So. Uh, while it was kind of more natural in terms of the models we're talking about to think of it in terms of these OM loop models, you may wish to think of it in terms of POTS models instead, okay, which have the same exponents. Okay. Uh, but it's not, but I should emphasize it's critical POTS and low temperature ON. Uh, now, the ground state, as I said, uh, of this model contains these long loops characterized by exponents so long as d is less than or equal to the square root of 2. Now, these are all arising in correlators, which in terms of the underlying spins are non-local, right? Because you're referring to things on the same loop. Whereas these spins, remember, these spins are just sort of, these loops are just where you have the up spins. And so it doesn't really care whether, you know, if you're computing a, in the quantum problem a spin-spin correlation function, you don't really care if they're on the same loop or not. And so these correlation functions of the quantum problem you know, the two spins are, in fact, uncorrelated and have correlation length zero, basically. So correlation functions of local operators have correlation length zero, uh, but there are these non-local operators, which have to do with things on the same loop, that have power laws associated with them. So there's this quasi-topological kind of uh, flavor, flavor to this, which is that in the ground state, local operators have this kind of topological flavor that you know, basically, they have correlation length zero. Uh, but then there are these non-local operators, which you can define, which have power laws associated with them. Now, you might think, well, OK, it's probably true in any wave function that if you cook up a crazy enough operator that's non-locally defined in terms of the underlying degrees of freedom, that it's likely to have power laws associated with it, right? I mean, if you, if you work hard enough, that's true. But I think that here, there's something, there's some real meat behind it, and it's because the meandering of these loops actually is related to the fact that there are low energy excitations in this model, which, uh, well, that there are low energy excitations, in other words, that there's no gap. And so what you can do is write down a trial wave function where instead of just. You don't have to present a gap. Yeah, there's a argument. That, that's what I'm about to present. Yeah. So, so yeah. So when I say trial wave function, let's try this wave function and check and see if it's if it has a gap or not. Okay. So it's obviously it's much harder to prove that you have a gap, but gaplessness. If you get lucky with a gas, you're you're in good shape. So uh, instead of just taking every configuration weighted by d to the number of loops, you take a wave function. So that would be just the just the ground state. But you now make the wave function change sign depending on whether you have configurations which, are, which have loops which are long or configurations which only have small loops in them. And so you can make this precise what you mean by long. It's not particularly important for what I'm about to say. So there is some way of making precise what x and y are here. And uh, since this model is critical, we can, we can certainly define long so that the probability of a configuration having a long loop is one half, say, okay? And when it's one half, that means that the overlap between this wave function and the ground state is going to be zero, so it's orthogonal to the ground state. And furthermore, you can see that, uh, you can check that the Hamiltonian has expectation value which goes as uh, an inverse power of the length in the large size limit, uh, and therefore that the gap vanishes, okay? So basically, the state space kind of breaks up in this way into state configurations with large loops and those which don't. You have a wave function that goes from 1 to minus 1. And basically because 
the Hamiltonian isn't connecting these two parts. The Hamiltonian basically doesn't distinguish the difference between psi 1 and psi 0 in some sense, right? The Hamiltonian isn't really very sensitive. To, the only part that you're really worried about is this part where the, there's this gradient here, and the Hamiltonian is not very sensitive to that. Okay. So in fact, <coughs> all of these models that you wrote down are actually a critical line parameterized by D. Okay. Um, so that's unusual because we know in two dimensions we have we have critical lines. Uh, but outside of two dimensions, we don't really have many examples. Here is this example, which in some way is boosting two-dimensional physics into three dimensions, okay? but also has much three-dimensional physics of its own. Uh, so, okay, so we also are interested in what the low energy effective field theory is for this critical line. And again, we can address all kinds of questions if we had this low energy field theory, but it has some unusual properties. First of all, that omega goes as k squared, which from that gaplessness proof you can deduce. Uh, secondly, a reasonable guess is that this also should be an SU2 gauge theory, since this is the structure we've been discussing. Uh, but also, this theory has to have some real juice to it because there are non trivial exponents associated with some non with some non local operators. But at the same time, local operators should be short range. Okay. Uh, so those first two requirements motivate the following guess, which is <coughs> a non-abelian gauge theory. If this term were, if this derivative weren't here, this would be what you'd call Yang-Mills theory. But we've essentially put in some extra derivatives into Yang. Yang-Mills theory uh, would give you omega goes as k, okay, which is bad. But the second thing, which Yang-Mills theory would give, which is bad, is this is a non-trivial interacting theory, even though it's kind of hidden in here, because B, defined in terms of the underlying gauge field, B is basically the spatial component, uh, the time component rather of the curvature. Okay. Uh, and so, well, it's the time component of the dual of the curvature, I guess. Um, so that's a nonlinear thing. So this is actually nonlinear theory. And uh, in the Yang Mills case, we know that this nonlinear theory is strongly interacting. In fact, it's not critical at all. It's a confining theory, has a mass gap, even though naively at tree level it looks like a critical theory. So we had to make some modification to standard Yang Mills theory. Now, there's still a question, which is that although this theory, again, is naively critical, that is to say it's critical at tree level, uh, it, and in fact the interactions are marginal, you may ask whether this interacting theory is actually critical. We don't have a full solution to this question, but at one loop, one can check that the coupling constant actually has vanishing beta function at one loop. So uh, if that survives to higher orders, then this theory is also critical, and that lends. I think that that will survive, because it's yeah. just at a tree level without that. You know, uh, right. Things, things like yeah. So. Right. Well, okay. So at y in Yang Mills theory, at tree level is critical. Let's say if I didn't have the second derivative, it's critical. But then if you consider the interactions, just by power counting, the interaction is relevant. Okay. So it's a given that it's strongly interacting, and then you can also show that those strong interactions lead you but to that phase. I mean, you don't expect that, like, if you go to two level, you're going to have that in the No, 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 no. I mean, uh, okay, so I haven't done the calculation. I don't have a proof that it's zero to all orders. There's something that's suggestive here, which is that actually E and A, which are the conjugate variables, appear on, in many ways on equal footing. Uh -huh. That the second derivative is here, and really here the second derivative is of A. So there's almost an EA duality. If you had a true EA duality, then it would be clear, because E and A really come with G and 1 over G. It's scaled in the most natural way. So. There isn't quite the duality that would make this a slam dunk, but there is some flavor of it. And it may be that with a clever gauge choice, which wasn't the right gauge choice to do this one loop calculation, but some other clever gauge choice, you might be able to show that in a certain gauge, it's, um, there is a duality that proves it. So I mean, I don't have a full solution, but my guess is that this isn't just a coincidence that it vanishes at one loop and that it vanishes to all loops as well.
And if that's true, then it's telling you that this beer is also in a critical line, and that is very tempting to, to say that you, since we knew about zero critical lines in three dimensions previously, and now we've found two of them, which have some similarities, maybe chances are they're the same thing. So uh, that's a tempting conjecture to make. Uh, some further uh, observations is that actually for G small, there's some additional perturbations that you can add, which have runaway flows. And that presumably corresponds to the large D case, where D is, sorry, that should be square when D is greater than or equal to square root of 2 which is basically like some classical limit, which is massive, as in the Q-state POTS models and OM models. Okay. So just to wrap up quickly then, uh, there is this sort of pictorial combinatorial description of topological phases. Uh, there are many open questions which one would like to address. So this kind of took us on this tour through electrons, topology, stat mech, gauge theories, and so on, but uh, very little to say about computer science, and since I'm here at a software company, I should, should probably should have said something. Um, but, you know, the goal is that here is that by understanding more about certain types of condensed matter systems that we could then have a, some kind of platform or an arena where one could do quantum computation. And, you know, those, un, those basic problems still are not understood in many ways. So, you know, this pictorial representation motivates certain types of microscopic models. So it's like this thing I was saying here. We have some ideas about soluble models here. But really, in, in the end of the day, you want to understand more about realistic models, uh, the kinds of things that experimentalists see in their systems or might be able to engineer. And so you really would like to perturb away from soluble models towards the more realistic ones. Um, you know, part of that problem may be uh, relate to this problem of whether it's kind of easier to get close to a critical point and assume that there are just relatively few relevant perturbations or whether you need to somehow impose these jones venzel relations in, in uh, kind of a more precise way. Uh, the latter situation would obviously be bad, uh, it, which is related, again, to the stability of this critical line. And uh, so I'd like to just finish up by mentioning a few references because I didn't put any references whatsoever in the body of the talk. There's a lot of foundational work here on the basic ideas of quantum computation and also many basic ideas about topological field theories uh, and the like. Uh, a couple of papers by us and some other people on uh, how you can motivate some microscopic models from these ideas and uh, some related quantum critical points and some things on that make a possible model. Thank you very much.